Yeah, thank me. Uh, thanks everybody for joining me today. Um, thanks for the introduction, Mika. So my name is Michael Butner. I'm from Ubisoft Toronto, and I'm really glad that I can uh, share a little bit of the technology that uh, we're working on, uh, that we were working on over the last two years, uh, and I like to call it motion fields. So a little bit uh, about myself. So I started uh, programming games something like uh, roughly 30 years ago. Some of the games. Uh, that I worked on in the early 90s. Uh, at some point, um, mid-2000, I joined IO Interactive. I worked on Hitman Absolution. I was mainly on the uh, G2 tech team. That's the engine. I wrote the animation system and all the tools. Um, at some point, uh, that engine was also used for um, uh, the next Deus Ex game. The guys in Montreal are working on that. Um, then in two years ago, two and a half years ago, I joined Ubisoft. Toronto, and since then the studio um, co-developed Assassin's Creed Unity and Far Cry 4. But um, I was um, working on a on a different project where I could focus on a little bit uh, animation research and physics research, and um, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So let's first have a look at what motion fields actually uh, can do, what it's all about. Um, a little bit of disclaimer. So this presentation will be all about the nitty-gritty details, all the tech behind everything. So it will be very, very bare metal. And uh, Simon Clavé here will talk about uh, um, how that entire thing looks in a, in a polished game towards the end, um, when, it, when it looks nice and polished and everything. So. Anyway, so um, first of all, I show, about, I show how everything looks like, um, and the rest of the talk will then go into detail how everything is implemented. And uh, my goal for this talk today is that uh, when you guys go home, back to your studios, you have all the tools to implement this technology into your animation systems. And I hope I can inspire you with that a little bit. So that is uh, a little demo. Um, this guy runs on roughly 20 minutes of mocap data. Um, simulating one character takes roughly 0.2 milliseconds. And um, it actually literally took me five minutes to set this up. It's once you have the files, the, the mocap files, you, um, you tell the system which mocap, what mocap data to use. You set up a bunch of rules, which we now cover in detail. And you get this as a result. There's literally, um, <laughs> eh. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> you have said you have seen that video before. It doesn't matter. No worries, we have a lot of stuff to cover. We will be over time, so it's all right. So yeah, um, this little video is, I made all the um, visual, visual, all the visuals I actually made uh, specifically for this presentation. So it's, uh, I made this specifically on a neutral character um, because I'm not allowed to share anything about the project that we are currently working on. Oh, perfect. Um, and as I said, Simu will later show how this entire thing looks in a final game. So, uh, yes. So when, when I thought about, well, how do I talk about motion fields and what it's all about, I thought about, well, let's quickly summarize how traditional animation systems really work. Um, so let's have a very, very brief look uh, at blend trees, state machines, time stretching, and all this stuff. So. Let's say somebody would, would want to start out uh, creating a new locomotion system for a game. Then you would usually start out with a bunch of clips that look like this. So you have uh, an idle pose, some banking animations, and walk, walks, and stops, and whatnot. And then you would try to um, arrange them in um, blend trees and state machines. So a blend tree usually looks like this. You have um, all your animations up here. You have a bunch of blend nodes. and um, Gameplay code decides which animations you blend together. I usually um, like to view it as a post trajectory event uh, cascade because this is the data that actually flows through the system. I only found um, 
screenshots from Unity when I when I Googled for blend trees. So um, it's a, it seems to be a very traditional setup this way. And let's say if we talk about um, locomotion, we usually parameterize on things like um, speed and direction. If we talk about a, a planar movement of a character, just a very simple example. So once we have that, of course, we need to then think about face matching. We need to, let's say, with animations that um, have a different duration, we then need to uh, mark animations up um, to make sure that they are properly time stretched. Um, let's say we have then transitions. They need to make sure that they start at the at the proper event. So if we are currently on a right foot plant, that whenever we transition, we start the new animation, the subsequent animation at the um, correct time step. So uh, this is a very example, very simple example of that. So blend node to animations, different durations. You can see this little hop here at this point, so no time stretching enabled. So you have to go in, um, find footsteps. You need to set markers. Oh, here's my, my, my right foot step. Here's my left foot step. Then you need to go back to the um, blend tree. You need to enable time stretching. And then the problem is, of course, gone. The little hop is gone, and the animations blend like they should be. It's, None of this is really a big deal, of course, but if you have thousands and thousands of animations and, and deep, deep blend trees, this is really, really error prone. So um, the next step beyond that is parametric blending. So uh, this connects to what Miko uh, talked about on Monday. Um, so let's say you have a, a two-dimensional or three-dimensional parametric space um, where one axis is um, the turning rate and the other axis is speed, then you throw a bunch of animations in and the system finds out which animations to blend together. And my main problem with that is that it solves part of the problem. It makes it easier to set up blend trees, of course, but it does not address at all um, weight shifting. So if I turn, for example, currently to the right and then I want to turn to the left, this is not just a simple straight blend. Uh, I shall have an example of that in a couple of slides. So um, the next step beyond um, blend trees is then, of course, state machines. Um, st this is a more uh, complicated example, but they, they do all the same. So let's say we have idle, swimming, climbing, locomotion, whatever, and we have transitions between those. So you quickly end up with a spider web of transitions, and each and every transition has specific uh, conditions to transition between those states. And it's just a hassle to set it up. It becomes the spider web, and, and everything can, can go wrong, of course, uh, as, as you go along. So um, all of this is just to say, this is a, a tiny little example of how you, what is required to set, set up a locomotion system. I haven't even talked about slopes or uneven terrain, how to incorporate that. Let's say we talk about straving, you need to consider how to solve this problem of feet crossing. This is, uh, this is another different beast. Let's say you want to insert something like plant and turns. You would need to introduce new states. You need to introduce conditions, when to trigger that. Um, so it's all a very, very manual process. So in general, to me, it sounds like a lot of tedious work. And I found this picture. This is a fruit fly counting robot. And when I think about setting up blend trees and state machines, this is what I think animators need to do. They need to count every little fly manually. So um, especially because they take raw mocap data as, as the input data, of course, and in order to make sure that clips um, can be blended together, they need to copy the first, the, the first post um, onto the last post and onto the, the post of the subsequent clip, make sure that um, these poses line up. And by that, of course, we lose a lot of fidelity that is already contained in the original uh, mocap data. And then on top of that, because we lost all this fidelity, we add layers on top of it to regain all that fidelity, right? And Every little thing can go wrong. It's a high complexity. It's a lot of work. Um, and blending animations does not respect momentum. And I found this. Um, so this is um, Christian Tatsiuk. This is our animation director at Ubisoft Toronto. Um, so he visits us again. He already visited us uh, this morning in uh, Alex's presentation. So I found this little clip from one of our mocap sessions. And I have this here in slow motion. So um, if you look at. Um, He's now in a right turn, and when he now wants to change direction, you can actually see his entire body uh, forming this U shape. He's already looking to, towards the other direction, but his momentum is currently 
um, moving him to the right, and he can't change his um, direction instantaneously. So you will never ever see this, this shape, this body shape, this weight shift, when you just blend um, banking animations. And that is uh, what I think is really, really wrong with parametric blending or any of these um, technologies. So first of all, I thought, well, you can't really take human motion and, and chop into the clips. That's sort of like a, a programmer trying to uh, paint a picture in my mind. It is much more difficult than that. Um, on the other hand, it's a lot of complexity that already goes into um, the setup. Um, is there some way to reduce the complexity? Um, and then on top of all that, well, it doesn't really look as good. It's, is there some way to improve the quality of all that? So even I had, of course, to introduce a cat picture. So, well, if it doesn't really sound like this impossible stretch. It is actually possible. Um, and for that, I would like to do a little experiment. So let's try to forget everything I said so far. Let's forget about blend trees, and let's try to think a little bit out of the box. So, and let's start by looking at raw mocap data. That's the highest quality data that we have. Let's look at that and see if we can make sense out of that. And I need to say, even though this presentation completely only focuses on locomotion, um, this idea is generic enough um, to be used for all sorts of different movements. So I, I will explain how to uh, create a locomotion system, but you can just as well use this for climbing or um, any other kind of locomotion. We even tried to use it for stumbling, and it works just as well. So this is, again, Christian in our mocap studio. Um, and the first time, we, we weren't really sure. The, the idea was just, well, let's try to capture some locomotion movements and then analyze the data and see what we can do with it. Um, the first time we did this, so it's, it's rather freeform. This is a shot from our first session. It's rather freeform. Um, Christian came up with this idea to, um, instead of, you can, for example, run around uh, for half an hour in a circle, but this would just be redundant data, right? So Christian came up with this sort of dance card idea where um, he broke down a, a move set into the least amount of moves with the, um, um, with the highest number of possible different variations for how a human can actually move around. And um, this is... Uh, Another example uh, from our second uh, mocap session, when he reaches that corner down here, you can actually see that he, oh, he forgot where to stop, right? So, and you can actually see this in the final result. So you can actually see this in your, on your final character. Um, it can be bad, it can be good. Uh, I'm just trying to say that um, you can see the entire characteristic. You can actually see the character of your character in game. So. Now we have the raw data. Now it gets a little bit more technical. Uh, let's have a closer look at it. I hope it doesn't get as complicated as this, but I won't promise. Um, so a little bit of terminology. Um, this is an animation rig like everybody uses. Um, I like to call it the animated hierarchy. So it starts at the hips, and then from, from there on, everything is stored in local space. We have our root. That's the global entity position that is stored in global space. On top of that, we have our mesh rig. That's what the skin mesh is uh, mapped to. And there's a mapping between the animation rig and the mesh rig. On top of that, we have a dynamics rig. That's the actual physical representation of the body, which is not used for motion field as such. But I get back to that at the end of the presentation. And whenever I say root animation or trajectory, it means the same thing. I just use that interchangeably. So. This is the data of this mocap shoot that I just showed with Christian. Um, it's 14 different animations, just broken up because uh, he got tired after half an hour. So, um, so we had to capture a number of times. Uh, and it's roughly 19 minutes of mocap data, 34,000 frames in total. It is three different movements, walk, jog, run, start, slopes, curves, and whatnot. And this is, of course, a visualization of the um, trajectory, right? So you can see long stretches, all the, the different circles and, and slaloms and curves and starts and stops and so on and so forth. So this is really just straight 
visualize the trajectory of all those animations. Um, so let's forget about this, the complicated data for a second. And let's say we have only three animations. And our task would be, how would I go about selecting um, a good animation um, based on three clips that I've been given? And we ignore, about, uh, we ignore the problem of finding a good pose match. We only look at trajectory. So in a traditional system, this would be, let's say, three clips, a forward animation and two banking animations. And usually what we do is we already know where our character, where we want our character to move to. But we usually modify a blend weight that blends across these animations. So we indirectly change or um, calculate the trajectory that we want our character to move on. But we already have the trajectories available, right? So now we do it the other way around. Let's say we have these three animations, um, and we are, select, we are supposed to select one of these animations and subject to some desired, magically given to us path. We get to that back later. How do we get this path? So let's say these are our three animation clips, only the trajectory, animation A, B, and C, forward, left, right. And this is our desired trajectory. The, um, this is the trajectory that we actually would want our character to move on. So if we now take one of those trajectories, that's a function um, that's, that's a font missing. OK, great. So this is uh, one trajectory here. And let's say this is function G, uh, function F. And the desired trajectory is function G. And both would be parameterized over parameter ranging from 0 to 1. If we now try to um, calculate the dissimilarity between those, we can simply sample um, those trajectories at some sample interval, um, take the difference, um, okay. um, take the difference between these sample positions and sum them up. So the, if those trajectories would be exactly the same, those number would, of course, be zero. The further they deviate, um, the higher the number is. I actually, this should show the actual uh, function, but the presentation is slightly broken. Anyway, so um, the code snippet for how to do this looks like this. We uh, simply iterate over um, an interval ranging from 0 to 1, sample the functions. f is uh, trajectory, and g is the desired trajectory. Subtract them, sum everything up, right? And the mocap data is actually not any different from, from this simple example. We just have a large number of possibilities. So instead of having only three clips, three choices, uh, if we use that example data that I showed previously, we just have 34,000 different choices. But it's essentially the same. It is the same because of that. So this is exactly the same picture I showed before with all the trajectory. Now I uh, show the uh, a current keyframe. Um, I draw the, the, the skeleton at this particular keyframe. And I draw the trajectory in red that starts at the character's current position and extends one second into the future. And if we take this one second piece of trajectory, we have something we can match against. So I need to say that whenever I say pose from now on, I actually mean the um, bone configuration of the character, as well as the trajectory that extends from that pose forward onto uh, up until some um, time horizon. It doesn't mean that this is, requires any different storage model or anything. It is exactly the same thing what we, what we are using today. It's just a slightly different mental model. The length of this uh, trajectory could be, um, could be seen as some planning horizon. If I use that, if I choose to play this animation, um, the character would move exactly on this trajectory over the next second. So these are, again, the uh, two trajectories here. And the only difference for using raw mocap data instead of the, the clips that I showed previously is that the candidate trajectory, the one that we actually select, is somewhere in world space, right? Uh, the guy was running around five meters away from the origin. Now that trajectory is somewhere else. So the only thing that we need to do is we need to inverse transform the entire, OK, animation broken, um, uh, 
we need to inverse transform this trajectory to the origin, and then we can uh, use exactly the same um, formula I showed before. So, but I said there was some trajectory given to us, some magic uh, trajectory that we can match against. Where does this come from? So, and the point is, usually we do know how our, where our character should move over time. Gameplay has a very precise notion of how the character should move. Um, gameplay does not know how the character moves, it, it knows where the character should move. The how is, of course, the, the job of the animation to actually select all the different poses and get the character to where it's supposed to be, but the positions are known by the gameplay code. So let's say our character is at time t0 at whatever current position. We can actually predict, extrapolate the position the character will be in, let's say, one second. That's the predicted position. And that's a little piece of, that's a little code snippet. Um, so it starts out with the character's current transform and his current velocity. And let's say we have one second time horizon that we want to extrapolate the character to. Um, we can then simply write it like this. It's, uh, of course, I know we can write this a little bit more concise, but there's a reason why I wrote it that way. So we can simply um, integrate the current velocity over that time horizon, and you end up with that position here. Now we fill that little gap in. Nobody says we are, of course, forced to, to keep that current velocity constant. We, um, we can now change that current velocity to express how our character should move. So let's say our char character is currently in idle, and we want him to run at 5 meters per second. We know that his desired velocity is 5 meters per second, and we know how fast he can accelerate. So, and we know that, that I need to say, all this is part of the um, gameplay code, right? So the, this is information that the gameplay uh, side needs to um, create, and how this information is created is, of course, different from game to game. And it also is different from movement type to movement type. If we talk about climbing, or any other kind of movement, this would change. This is really specific to locomotion. But um, here I'm now changing the linear, linear velocity for each and every time step to exponentially decay towards the predicted, um, the desired velocity, the, one, the velocity that we actually want to achieve. And I use a, an exponential decay because I want to um, decay towards that desired velocity over this time frame. And here I'm just using a very simple um, second order expansion of the exponential decay. You can use any other smoothing function. Um, it doesn't matter how this predicted path is actually generated, um, but this is, the, this is actually the way we use it. And this is an example for how that looks like. So the, the green line is the predicted trajectory. So the, the character is currently where the, the green line and the red line meet. This is where the character currently is. The green line is based on, runs the exact code that I just showed on the previous slide. And uh, the desired velocity is determined by the stick input. The red line is the past trajectories, the, the past transforms of the character over one, over the last second. So the entire line is two seconds long, so to say. Um, if we talk about AI characters, um, we can use exactly the same thing. We, can, uh, we usually have a, a Pathfinder path, which could be used to generate this um, uh, predicted trajectory. So <clears throat> all the formulas are broken. That's nice. Um, OK, fine, fair enough. So. This was exactly the same. We simply sample along these trajectories, take the difference between those sample points, and that results into a number that tells us how um, good these two trajectories match. And if you could see it, the, there's a formula that expresses that. Uh, it's just a fancy way to say what I just said. Anyway, so. This is from now on called the objective function. It's a scalar valued function, which um, has the property that the lower the value, the better the match. But we can add whatever we want to this objective function. It is simply um, sort of a constraint that expresses what we want to achieve with our animation. And 
in the following example, I only take trajectory positions into account, so everything that uh, we covered so far. So, but how would, in, how would we now go about actually selecting the animation? So, let's throw out a ridiculous idea. Let's say we have our 34,000 poses or 100,000 poses, and we just loop over all of them, run this objective function against all of the animations for one second into the future, and find the best match. Uh, a super brute force approach would be would look like this. We just loop over all the poses, run the, evalu the run the objective function evaluation, remember which one resulted into the minimum cost, and this is our next animation. So, if that would ever work, um, the good thing about this is that transitions would be handled automatically. So, let's say we have uh, a turn right animation and we um, shift into a turn left animation. This is actually a transition. It's actually not a blend. Um, this would be handled automatically. If we talk about uh, walking animations, our, our mocap data maybe leads into a turn right animation, but we keep pushing forward, then we would simply reselect the, the beginning of this walk animation. So transitions and uh, regular loops would be handled um, the same way. Well, let's try this out. This is exactly the same setup that I showed in the initial video. And with those modifications that I just showed, it would look like this. So the guy has obviously did some trouble playing in animation at all. The good thing is I can already control him very precisely. So I'm controlling the guy right now in that video. So I can, I can precisely control him already. But well, it doesn't look good. Fine. Well, there's obviously something missing. We don't match poses, of course. We need to, um, the, the reason why it, re why it keeps, why it, why it gets stuck in an animation is that whenever we find a piece of trajectory that matches our current desired trajectory, we reselect that pose so he gets stuck in that. Um, there's no incentive for the guy to actually play through an animation. But uh, I guess this, yeah, okay. <clears throat> so the uh, invisible objective function um, says, well, the objective function actually would say, if we could read it, uh, it's the sum of the um, um, pose comparison. So we sample across the trajectory. And then we can add something to it, right? It's just a constraint for, well, the font is broken. It's not, only, it's not only that it's black, the font is broken as well, so it doesn't matter. Whatever. So the point is we can add constraints to this function. It's really just a function that tells us what, what we want to do. So um, pose matching. So the idea is that we can simply um, add to our objective function how good we think a trajectory is plus how good we think the pose is. And we can see that later that depending on that ratio of how we rate um, pose matching over trajectory matching, we can actually um, some sort of imagine we have a slider that says how responsive the system is versus how, how good the quality of the system is. So, on, so on, um, an animator can actually go in and say, well, we changed that ratio um, in order to increase quality over responsiveness. Um, yes, so this would be the, uh, the actual objective function, if we could see it. Um, one last word on uh, post spaces. So all our animations are stored in local space, like I guess everybody does. Um, but in order, for example, to um, compare specific joint positions, we need to know them in global space. Um, we get back to that in a second. Um, the pose matching. Uh, a key difference to how we do this is that um, when we usually talk about pose comparison, we think about comparing the, the full body pose, but this is actually um, exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, and that was one of the key things that actually Simo um, figured out. So it's a genius idea, I think. Um, so if we talk about locomotion, um, we are only really interested in where our foot positions are. We don't, we don't really care about where our hand positions is. If we transition into a plant and turn, our hands could be slightly off. That doesn't matter. What we are really, really concerned about is, is our uh, feet positions. So we don't use all the joints. We only use the joints for the particular movement that we are actually um, uh, interested in. If we talk about animals, we might uh, um, use 
feet positions as well, or if we talk about climbing then as well, if we talk about melee combat, uh, melee combat, we, we could use uh, the sword position or whatever. It depends on the type of movement. So um, now that we, we are only interested in certain aspects of the animation, like the trajectory and certain um, joint positions, and this information Um, is what we call metadata, and this is stored in a, in a separate piece of memory, uh, cache-friendly, compressed format, and we only use this for post-comparison and trajectory comparison. So this is um, the same data set as before, the trajectory, and um, the overall trajectory of the entire set, the trajectory in front of the character, but now he has his yellow balls carrying around with him. That's the actual metadata. It's the position of the feet that we now added to the system. So metadata is always in character space. So for example, a left foot swing could look like this. It's uh, my stupid programmer drawing. Bear with me. So as the left foot swings forward and uh, the root remains roughly uh, in, in the middle between the feet, three keyframes could look like this. Just an example for how the metadata could look like. If we now add all this together, so this is now a matching trajectory and the pose with uh, what I just explained, it looks something like this. It still doesn't look good. There's a lot of jarring movements, but he can already play in animation and I can control him at the same time. So obviously there's trajectory matching missing. We we don't respect the rate of change, uh, the rate of change of positions for trajectory as well as for the joints that we are pose matching against. Um, since velocity is a vector quantity, we can simply use it the same way as we use positions. We take the difference between the two and use it in our objective function. So this is now this exactly the same data, but I added velocity to the meter data. So the the little lines that come out as feet is the actual velocity of uh, the feet joints for each and every keyframe, of course. So there's one last thing missing. Um, if, we, if we now use velocity, we can increase the quality of our objective function, but we can't really distinguish between, let's say, um, our mocap data has, of course, animations that just uh, have a slight turn to the left, and they have, of course, animations that have a left turn and a right turn, and these animations look radically different, so we need a way to distinguish between um, an animation that actually turned left and then right, or just continuously right, so we need to distinguish between monotonous and non-monotonic animations, and for that, we use that red curve that I showed previously. So the, the green curve, the green um, trajectory was what we think, what we want the character to do. The red line was the, was the trajectory curve that the character actually went through, and we used both. So we used the current frame of the character and use one second into the future to match against candidate poses and use the past to be able to distinguish between these monotonic versus non-monotonic monotonic curves. If we now use all of this together, it looks like this. And this is, by the way, exactly the same video that I showed at the very beginning. So this now uses trajectory position, trajectory velocity. Um, it only matches uh, on left and right foot position uh, and velocity, and it uses past matching. So it's a quick recap. Um, This will now be a little bit difficult without reading the math formulas, but OK. So on the left-hand side, you would, in theory, see a formula that says um, we have an, a function that is a sum of three terms. It's the pose comparison plus the future directory plus the past directory of the character. The code snippets are an exact translation of that function. So this is how we, uh, this is of course a very, very simplified version, but in theory it looks like that. 
So current cost looks like this. We start out with zero, and then we add the um, right and left foot current position and, and velocities for right and left foot. We run this once for the current pose. And the trajectory cost we run twice for the future trajectory and as well for the past trajectory. Every frame we run through all the poses and jump to the one with the lowest cost. Jump means we stop playing our current animation and jump to that pose if we find a pose that is a better match than the immediate next pose that we find. It is a very, very stupid uh, simple hill climbing, or you could say a uh, steepest descent algorithm. It's extremely simple. Um, the important part here are these lambdas here. So, of course, we add positions and velocities together. So we add apples to oranges. So we need some way to um, normalize these values. So these lambdas serve two purposes. The one is that we normalize all the values such that we can add it together that we can compare them to get a meaningful result. And the second one is that there are lambdas here that normalize these values, i.e. this, the current pose, gives us um, values between 0 and 20 or 30 or whatever. And the same goes for this guy here. This gives us also, this normalizes everything for position and velocity and returns a value between zero. We found an animation that matches exactly precisely or some other number, 20, 30, 40, 50. If we now change the ratios between these and these lambdas, we can choose between higher quality or higher responsiveness. So, well, of course, nobody wants to write these little code snippets um, in their game, at least I don't want to. Um, uh, and also, we have many different movement types. We might have different movement types where we need uh, feet and hands, where we have um, completely different um, constraints, um, different setups, maybe different rigs, whatever. Uh, and of course, a data-driven approach is anyway much better. So I looked long at these uh, objective functions, at these little code snippets that I just showed, and at some point I thought, well, the current pose is always constant, all the lambdas are constant, everything in these little code snippets is completely constant. The only thing that changes is we run all 34,000, 100,000 poses through the exact same setup every frame. And all of these little code snippets operate on a little piece of metadata, metadata that is also constant over the lifetime of the game for all the animations. The setup does not change. At some point, this sounded to me very much like vertex and pixel shaders. So then I built a node graph system out of that. So this is exactly the same code that I showed previously, all these utility functions expressed as a node graph. So this is the current cost function. Um, up here is, um, I'm not sure if I can read it, uh, right foot position, here's velocity, here's left foot, and so on and so forth. I just take the differences, multiply uh, with a sort of with a bunch of lambdas, and calculate some number. I do the same for future. This is the trajectory that is ahead of us. All these node graphs are executed 34,000 times per frame. Um, this is a tiny little. Um, snippet out of this node graph. This is a simplified version of the current cost function. So this now simply uses, uh, only uses the right foot position and the right foot linear velocity. I subtract them, multiply by some magic value, add them together, and this is my, my utility function. In that little example, I'm only using the right foot position and right foot velocity. And the metadata that is associated with that looks like this little block up there. If I now start using, let's say, hips height, then this would be included into the metadata as well. But we only include the data that we actually use in these node graphs in the metadata. If we have this set up, you could actually already see that this could be compiled into some sort of stack machine, right? We, we read some value here, we read some value here, then we pop two values and, and store one back. 
And you could also easily imagine that you have this uh, sort of pseudo assembly language um, calculated out of this setup here. The tricky part is, or the what I fi find the interesting part here is that uh, I can now access, for example, when I talk about right foot position, I can always get this information at index zero of the current metadata. If I talk about the um, right foot velocity, I can always get this out of index one of the current velocity. I just need to change two pointers to tell it, well, do I run this on my current pose or do I run this on my current candidate, which I run 34,000 times or 100,000 times. And you can also imagine that you can compile this into super fast SSE assembly code, and this is exactly what we do. So um, when we started out experimenting with that, we handcrafted everything, um, all the objective functions. Um, we didn't really pay too much attention to data layout. Uh, we did everything really brute force. Um, the result was we had 20 minutes of mocap data. That seems to be sort of a magic number. Um, at least that gives you really good results. One character um, ran uh, used, used up to 15 milliseconds at peak time. And for our demo with a bunch of characters, we simply brute force it, used eight cores in parallel, and just, uh, well, we crossed our fingers and everything worked fine, but it's, of course, not usable in a final game. This idea with uh, using motion shaders and condense all the information the way I just showed allowed us to bring the a single objective function evaluation down to roughly 400 cycles. I'll talk more about performance a little bit later. So the only thing that is now missing is, well, we still if, have to visit all 50,000 or 34,000 poses every frame. We can't use this in a game. If, we, if an animator adds 10,000 more poses, then it takes more time and more memory. We don't want that, right? That's the biggest thing that is, of course, makes it unusable. So if you look at it, uh, man, OK. Uh, yeah. So essentially, it's a, it's a minimization problem. It's a function, and we, find, we want to find the global minimum, right? It's a bounded problem, because we know exactly for how many keyframes we want to evaluate this. It's unconstrained. There are no other constraints. It's a simple minimization problem. We evaluate that function for as many keyframes as we want to or need to, and we find the minimum one. Um, this is a strategy actually Seymour uses. I think he still uses that one. Um, so the idea is you just train the game, right? When you, you, you do this brute force approach every frame, and as you change your stick input, you just remember which poses you jump to. Um, and the longer you, you train the system, um, the better it gets. And at some point, you flip a switch, and the game um, only satisfies the objective function out of the remembered decisions that the, the, the decisions that are previously remembered. Um, I didn't like it particularly much because um, it means you change that. Uh, you have to retrain the game every time you change the animations, and there is no upper bound for how much, how many functions you evaluate every frame. And I really wanted to have an absolute maximum bound. So how does the function actually look like, what, we're, what I'm talking about? Um, so down here, it would actually show the actual functions. But the important part is, so let's say the, the blue curve here is the pose comparison curve, right? So on this axis is keyframes. This is just an example graph. It's not an, an actual function plot. So this is, let's say, 1,000 poses. And this is the value of the objective function. Of course, the pose comparison function looks like sort of a sine curve because human movement is repetitive. Just step forward, left, step right, and so on and so forth. The yellow function here is the trajectory function. And that changes, of course, drastically. Um, and we don't really know how it looks like. It could have all sorts of uh, hills and troughs. Um, we don't really know how it looks like. We know, of course, there are minima, because there, are, there must be trajectories that match the one that we are actually asking for. But we don't know where they are. And the worst thing is, this changes as we change our stick input. Um, because we ask for a new direction, and we ask for new velocities, that function changes every frame. And on top of all that, 
we actually ask for a minimum value uh, of the sum of those two. So um, the green curve here is the sum of the pose comparison and the trajectory comparison. All I'm trying to say is this is the worst case scenario for an algorithm that would try to find, that would try to uh, follow uh, um, the steepest descent because it would immediately get caught in a local minima. And even if those algorithms would work, there is no guarantee on the upper bound. Those algorithms just follow the steepest descent and evaluate the function as many times as it wants to. So then I thought, well, we could simply find the minima of individual functions collect those minima, and then evaluate the, the entire objective function for those minima that we found. Um, but that doesn't really help us with the problem that, this, that at least the trajectory function changes every frame. Um, so I thought about, well, couldn't we simply um, get rid of the, the information that changes every frame and store somehow the information that is constant. And we can store the, um, how distant one poses for, to another. We can store um, how distant one trajectory compared to another is. That is something that never changes, that is constant. And that suddenly turns the entire thing into a simple nearest neighbor search algorithm. So uh, even though k nearest neighbor, so k nearest neighbor simply means given some query point in a high dimensional space, returns you the k best matches nearest neighbors for that query point. Um, it's sort of a machine learning classification, classification algorithm, but it's so simple that I actually don't like to call it machine learning. But well, what can you do? So, um, so the idea is we can't really build connectivity graphs. So we can't um, store how close is one, one pose to another. This would, um, this would use an insane amount of memory, for example, for, uh, for an idle pose. I could possibly find uh, or probably find 10,000 other idle poses. Um, but I can store how, um, how distant one object to another is. And one object is, we get to that in a second. Um, the last sentence actually contains math variables. It's, it's actually a proper sentence. It's not that I can't write it. Um, anyway, it simply means, given some query point, I find um, the best matches. So, well, we could, of course, now use the, the current pose and store uh, information about neighboring poses, or we could store um, how closely related are two trajectories to each other. And um, it is way more efficient to store the neighborhood of trajectories than for poses. So to reiterate, if I, let's say, I have a trajectory that I actually want to achieve, I could ask for, hey, I want to know the 500 best trajectories that match this. And then for those 500 trajectories, I evaluate the entire objective function to, in order to find the global minimum. That's the idea. Or I could ask, well, I'm currently in this pose. Give me the 500 best poses for those neighbors. Find, uh, evaluate the objective function and give me the, um, and we remember the global minimum. If I'm currently in idle pose, I probably find 10,000. I will not find the global minimum. It's much more better. It's much better to find the best trajectory neighbors. Then, well, how do I actually, how do you find um, closest neighbors? Um, so of course we, we can't really store an entire second of trajectory in um, we, we somehow need to come up with what is an element in our in our space for which we find neighbors. So we now decided, okay, we want to use trajectories. Well, I can't store uh, let's say thirty samples for one second um, trajectory. That is way too much data. Um, well, another math function. So we actually subsample a one second trajectory. So usually we take three or four subsamples, and for each subsample, we store um, the position and velocity for this trajectory. So it's 
three points, and every point has a position and a velocity. In total, this is 18 scalar values. So you could imagine a given trajectory can be represented as an 18-dimensional vector. So I came across this idea of uh, multidimensional scaling. And the idea for that is, given some high-dimensional vector, um, <laughs> I can, of course, calculate what's the difference, what's the delta between point A and point B, right? And that delta, this difference, is just a scalar value. And imagine you just throw some random particles in a three-dimensional space, and they, of course, a random distance. You can then run a particle simulation with a spring attached to them that brings them over time to the desired distance. It's actually a... Um, a visualization algorithm for high-dimensional data. So if we apply this idea to two, to two points, um, it could look like this. Th these two points should be two units apart. We can do the same with four points. And the distance that I would like them to have is roughly oriented in a, in a rectangle. Well, nothing prevents us from trying to do this with uh, 5,000 poses, right? And here, every particle represents a trajectory, and the trajectory um, is defined as what I said previously, these 18 dimensions, the subs, this, a trajectory subsample. I now s trigger the, the simulation. It actually forms a nice um, shape and actually tells us how closely related are trajectories to each other. And there's, uh, there's a little red line here. It's probably a little bit difficult to see that um, I simply draw the, the a current keyframe. I draw the skeleton. That's the skeleton guy up there. And the red line is, uh, is a connection from my current position to the next position as it flows through this field. Um, if you pay close attention, this line jitters a lot. It simply means the system comes to a rest, but um, there's too much stress. It doesn't really, it's not good enough um, to make nearest neighbor queries. It's good for visualization, but it's, it's not good enough to make any queries. I then came across local sensitivity hashing. That's a different algorithm. Uh, at the end of the day, I tried everything out. It doesn't work. Um, don't use it. Uh, KD trees, I said, in high dimensional space, they, uh, uh, they exponentially decay to linear search, so it's not any better as really running through all 30 or 50,000 poses. I can only say this is not true. Um, it works perfect. Uh, it takes 0.1 milliseconds for 50,000 poses. It's, a, it's an O log N. You can throw 100,000 poses at it, and it works the same way. So the idea is for 18 dimensions, you, you make a, a split for every dimension, right? And when you, when you insert uh, one of these trajectory points in your high dimensional space, for every element in this vector, you'll make a split in your KD tree. I actually took this picture from Wikipedia. There's a nice explanation how that actually works. Um, so this is an example. So the red dots are um, the query point in this KD tree, and the white lines are the 400 nearest neighbors in this uh, motion library. Then we simply Given some query point, I can now pretty much with no time, uh, and this is not even optimized. I'm pretty sure I can get this to uh, less than 0.01 milliseconds. Um, so I can very easily ask for um, the 200 or 400 nearest neighbors. The yellow guy is a random position out of those neighbors. So the final algorithm now looks like this. I start out with, oopsie. Um, I start out with a number of neighbors that I actually want to visit. This is something that the animator can define. So let's say uh, 400 or 200. We find those, then we run this motion shader, which contains essentially the utility function, and remember the, the global minimum for all of those. And that's the final algorithm. Just implement this, and you get the same result. Um, it's, it's the actual code. <laughs> that I showed here, it's not, it's not pseudocode. OK, so uh, a word on performance. Um, for anybody who thinks that new 
or dynamic arrays are still the way to go, I highly recommend Googling for data-oriented design. This is not the way to go. You should really, really make sure that you uh, make sure that your data is aligned to cache lines, that you have no cache messes, and so on and so forth. So I did this with uh, um, the idea of motion shaders. This brings me down to, so the actual time that we spent to read the metadata out of memory is the, is the time that we actually spent calculating the actual objective function is nothing compared to that. So the time it takes to read it out of memory is the, is the amount of time, is the upper bound of the time it takes. Essentially, the um, evaluating 400 neighbors uh, takes 0.05 milliseconds. Memory footprint, usually because of we have so much redundancy in the data set, we only use 20% of the actual data. This is an area of improvement. Yet, so far, I don't really know how to, if somebody gives me 50,000 poses, I can't really tell which ones are the important ones, which ones are actually used, and which, what are the 80% that are not used. So this is something that we, that we, this information we gather over time and then prune the data set at some point. I would, if somebody has an idea for how to do this automatically, I would be all ears. Um, so, but essentially, if, if we would prune these 80%, the total amount of memory that we spent uh, on memory for, for this particular movement set would be 3.9 megabyte. So I usually get asked, well, how can animators uh, control responsiveness over quality? I already said this twice. Then I get usually asked, hey, how can I implement this in my traditional system? I cover that now. Uh, and how do animators like the system? So this is a, a node in our animation system. So the animation system is really just a very traditional uh, hierarchical um, blend tree system. This is a node that animators can use if they want to. They can stick it into a state or can they, they can feed it into a blend tree. They can even blend two motion fields together. It doesn't really matter. So it's a drop run replacement for movement systems. So once I have that, uh, animators could go in and pretty much cut out an entire uh, state that they previously used blend trees for, and then they can now use one node instead of that. They can use it as much or as little as they want, and it's uh, particularly interesting for transitions. So this is a little example for how it's integrated into the rest of the animation system. So um, the locomotion state, so this little example is three nodes. Uh, it is a motion field node. It is a physically simulated state where the guy falls flat on his face and the get up. So just to show how you can, okay, once more, um, how you can integrate it into a traditional system. It can, it's, it's really a replacement. It, it, think of it as, a, as an animation source node. It's no different at all. Then I get usually asked, hey, can we, can we use layers for that? And I think, um, well, it's, it's a little bit difficult because there's no sync tracks in, in the motion field node. Yes, you can do tricks in your objective function to, let's say, synchronize lower body and upper body. In general, I think layers is a super bad idea and it should not be used at all. There are much better options. Um, this now ties into the talk from Alex this morning. I hope you all uh, um, attended that one. So um, for the actual runtime side of uh, our um, system. Of course, we start out with the animation rig, the mesh rig, and then on top of that, we have our dynamics rig. So it's just, it's, it is in a way just a, a regular ragdoll setup with physical bodies and constraints that hold these bodies together. Um, the difference is that this is very tightly integrated into the actual um, runtime of the system, and it can be used as a node. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's an extremely lightweight sequential impulse solver, and all the rules that uh, Alex was talking about uh, are used by constraints. Um, so this is our motion field guy, and I just want to show that he's actually uh, an always simulated character. No time to go into details. So um, Alex again, uh, Christian again. Sorry, I get confused. Um, so. He always liked the system, so he's our animation director, and I had to convince him to, to really use that system. And he always liked it, but I think the moment where he really loved it was uh, we were one day before an important milestone, and he had the idea, hey, let's change our entire movement set. I want to add, I want to add a new movement set. So he went to our mocap studio, uh, mocap the new movement set. It took two hours to get the data back. He hooked it up in 10 minutes, and it worked 
Um, and the next day we had our important milestone, and from, from there on, he just loved it. I think, uh, oh yeah, you can of course use keyframed animations as well. You don't have to use mocap data. And I think the system would allow animators to actually uh, focus on making movements instead of chopping clips. Um, pros and cons, I think it's a huge time saver for production uh, and it gives much higher quality um, as well. Of course, it's difficult for animators to adapt to this system, but I think the, uh, the outcome is worth stuff like this. Thank you very much. Thank you.